Kia ora tātou. Hey, just hope that everyone can come sit down, have a seat, and get everybody comfortable so that we can kick off the proceedings for today. Uh, tuatahi, he mihi tēnei, kia koutou katoa. No mai, haere mai, whakatau mai, ki tēnei kaupapa whakahirahira, the Privacy Forum 2021. And isn't it amazing? It's a packed house, which tells me that everyone here is very interested in privacy, protecting privacy, but also really interested in what are the developments in privacy, especially since COVID has hit Aotearoa. So before we kick off um, the day, can I just make sure that everybody's feeling comfortable, everyone's seated or has a seat? How's everybody feeling anyway? Are you feeling okay? Awesome. Kapai. O tuatahi he mihi tēnei uh, ki te mana whenua o te whanganui ātara, te ateawa, ngāti toa, ngāti raukawa. Ko rātou uh, ngā tokotoru tapu o tēnei whenua, uh, o tēnei rohe, um, ngā mihi kautu kia, kia rātou. Kia koutou, ko tai mai ki tēnei kaupapa, um, o koutou awa, o koutou maunga, o koutou whakapapa, uh, ngā mihi kauatu kia koutou. Mauri ora. Uh, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tara tara ki tai. E hi aki ana te ata kura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei, mauri ora. Mauri ora. Ko Kei Marie Dan Tōku Ingoa, my name is Kei Marie and I'm very privileged to help guide, support, assist and even hurry some of our speakers along <laughs> over the course of the day. Um, we have a jam-packed program uh, finishing off at 12.40, so hoping that we all have our ears open, our eyes and also our hearts in regards to the information that will be shared today. To all of our presenters, um, and most importantly to the Privacy Commission for having the foresight and the intent for bringing all of us together today. I thank you, I thank all of you for being here, and let's have a great time in learning and listening. Before I kick off, I do have a few housekeeping um, rules for us today. In regards to Wellington being well known for wind, uh, but also some potentials around earthquakes, uh, if an earthquake alarm does occur, uh, please stay in the room and uh, look after each other. I'd really like to make sure that we're not trying to tackle each other on the way out the door. <clears throat> and also, in case of a fire, um, we'll just be slowly making our way downstairs um, to wait for further instruction. Thirdly, this is an interactive event, and so we would love your feedback, your questions, your insights. So the team have created this cool system, which if you had come to the last Privacy Forum, uh, called Slido. So if you haven't yet, please download the Sly, S-L-I dot D-O app to your phone, and this is an opportunity for you to loud and proud, ask a question, or also do so anonymously. The code is Privacy Forum. Yep, Privacy Forum. And so after each speaker or even throughout the day, you have an opportunity to just pose some questions and also, uh, hey, let us know if something's not quite working for you also. Uh, you can vote. So depending on how many votes uh, get attached to a particular question, I'll make sure I ask those. But otherwise, um, please use that as an opportunity for you to share your thoughts and also ask some good questions. For today. So, uh, unfortunately, some of our guests were unable to um, be here today, um, but they had the opportunity to share their thoughts and their insights with you all. So, first up, we have an opening address from uh, Honourable Chris Farfoy, the Minister, Minister of Justice, who's just going to open up our hui and let us know how does he feel about privacy, um, but also why he believes it's important for all of New Zealand. Kia ora. Kia ora koutou and welcome to the 2021 Privacy Forum. I'm delighted to give the opening address as Minister of Justice and I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person today. The theme of your conference is making privacy a priority. As we all know, personal information is more valuable than ever before. Exchanges of personal information are central to our everyday lives and this information is vulnerable to misuse if care isn't taken to ensure it's secure. Trust in our agencies and the way they handle personal information is important to everyone and people's trust in how we do that is vital for every government agency. 
We've worked through privacy issues in our response to the COVID-19 pandemic, where contact tracing has been a critical tool. And we see the importance of privacy to other technological developments too, from artificial intelligence and machine learning to facial recognition, camera equipped drones, deep fakes and synthetic media, they all pose questions around issues of privacy and protecting people's information. I'd like to begin by reflecting on the recent enactment of the Privacy Act of 2020. The Act reflects how privacy touches nearly every aspect of our lives and how New Zealanders want their privacy protected in our fast changing lives. The Act also ensures flexibility to handle those developments in technology and other unexpected challenges that may arise both locally and internationally. The new Act has made a number of changes and I think it's worth noting three. First, the introduction of mandatory breach notifications. Any organisation that experiences a privacy breach is now required to make a notification to the Privacy Commissioner and to affected individuals. This is one of the most significant and widely discussed developments leading up to the introduction of the new Act. Second, the Privacy Commissioner now has an increased role under the Act. The Commissioner is now able to issue compliance notices to businesses or organisations to require them to do something or stop doing something in order to comply with the Act. The Commissioner is also now able to direct agencies to provide individuals access to their personal information. And this will allow faster resolution of complaints relating to Privacy Principle 6, which gives people the right to ask for access to their own information. And finally, the introduction of Information Privacy Principle 12, which regulates the way personal information can be sent overseas. This principle strengthens cross-border protections to reflect the increasingly globalised economy that New Zealand agencies operate in. I'd also like to acknowledge the proactive approach taken by the Privacy Commissioner and his office in the development and implementation of the Act. The, commission, the Commissioner's Privacy is Precious campaign has raised awareness of the new Act and promoted good privacy practice through their videos and the wealth of resources they have made available. This work helps to ensure all New Zealanders understand their privacy rights and how those rights are strengthened in the new Act. I'd also like to acknowledge the Privacy Commissioner and his officer's commitment to better understand what privacy means to New Zealand's diverse cultural communities. Specifically, the, commissioners, the Commission's understanding of its responsibility to engage with Māori as treaty partners to understand privacy from the perspectives of Te Ao Māori. I also note the new Act's requirement for the Privacy Commissioner to consider cultural perspectives on privacy and exercising the Commission's functions. Passing this legislation is a clear signal to New Zealand that privacy is a focus and will continue to be a focus for us. Two of our key government priority areas are housing and public health. Both raise significant privacy challenges and opportunities. The Office of the Privacy Commissioner is engaging with the rental sector to better understand current privacy practices and business models of agencies that operate within the sector. This follows on from the Commissioner's concerns about some of the data collection, retention and disclosure practices of property management agencies. Also, managing health and personal information has been important in New Zealand's COVID-19 pandemic response. The COVID app and its features, underpinned by our privacy regime, allows users to retain control of their personal information. And having a robust privacy regime that has the trust and confidence of the general public has contributed to the success of contact tracing. New Zealanders' uptake of the app reflects their trust in the privacy safeguards around it, and the privacy regime has also been instrumental in protecting returnees' private information as they go through managed isolation. Look, it's clear from the work being done that the privacy space is a busy space for agencies at the moment. And examples of the work also being done are MB's work on establishing a consumer data rights regime to give individuals and businesses greater choice and control over their data. Secondly, DIA's work on a digital identity trust framework which seeks to modernise the government's digital identity infrastructure and finally, StatsNZ's work on an updated legislation which will support continued trust and confidence in New Zealand's official statistics and government use of data, including appropriate privacy, security and transparency settings. Outside of these specific pieces of work, the government is also mindful of evolving areas both in Aotearoa and internationally, such as surveillance technology, artificial intelligence, the digital economy and international developments in privacy law. Once again, I'd like to acknowledge the work being done by the Office of the Privacy Commissioner and all of you in the room and across government. Good luck for the rest of the forum. I know you've got some excellent speakers coming up. Kakite anō.
Thank you, Minister. I, it's a bit strange, right, because we're going to you know, clap our hands to the Minister, but let's have a, give him a whole mind to Paki Paki anyway. <coughs> Hopefully, wherever he is, he'll be able to feel, feel um, the aroha from the room. So what I did here um, is that there are a range of different developments. Um, our privacy is precious, um, but it's also very multi-layered and multifaceted across uh, personal uh, slash individual um, the impact of technology, um, also the impact of legislation, um, but most importantly, the elements that I do love about the Privacy Act are the principles, and the principles really require us as New Zealanders to, to utilise them as a guideline um, and or best practice um, in the way that we manage, uh, store and protect um, people's New Zealanders' data. So just a couple of things before I welcome our next um, keynote address. For those uh, that are coming up on um, our first panel, uh, Craig, Ashok and Serena, um, just about 10 minutes before you're ready to get up on stage, can I just ask you to head to the back here um, to our amazing AV team so that they can mic you up to ensure that our whanau here can hear you well. Without further ado, um, based off the back of this corridor from our Minister, can I please invite uh, John Edwards, the Privacy Commissioner, to give us an update on what is happening across the privacy space. Tēnā koe, John. Kia ora, thank you. No mai, hari mai, kia ora koutou katoa. There are no new privacy breaches to report. <laughs> Thank you for coming to our forum. Uh, this is the first one we've had since 2018. So I'll spend the bulk of my time um, filling you in on what we've been up to in the intervening period. One of the things that we've done is that for the first time ever, as mentioned by the Minister in his um, thoughtful and generous uh, opening words, uh, was to develop a public awareness campaign it was a real challenge. Uh, we had, was supported by an excellent um, comms team and external um, uh, marketing and advertising agency. Uh, but to distill down, you know, 200 sections of difficult legislation into, you know, that covers the entire economy, uh, into a message that uh, showed the relevance of privacy in our day-to-day -day lives um, and um, tried to give some essence of what those 12 information privacy principles are. So I think, um, I won't ask to raise your hands if you haven't seen the video. I'll show it to you again anyway, because you might have only seen it once, and it bears a second or third or fourth <laughs> viewing. Um, so if I could ask the tech person to hit the play on. Personal information is precious. You have to treat it with care. If you're someone who uses personal information, you must protect it and respect it. Make sure it's hidden away from others, but easy for you to find. The Privacy Act has changed. You'll have to report serious breaches. Know what's new at privacy.org.nz. Now, I don't want to be that explainy guy, um, but um, there's three little vignettes uh, and there's three actors. And the thing that you may not notice on a single viewing is that each actor has two roles. In the opening scene, we see a young woman handing over her driver's license to a mechanic. She's entrusting him with uh, her personal information. He takes it uh, and treats it carefully. In the next scene, the mechanic is signing in to a contact tracing register at a rugby club uh, in front of a guy who's sweeping up. The sweeping up guy takes the register and carefully locks it away in a lockbox. And in the final scene, that guy from the rugby club is at the uh, medical centre picking up his notes from the nurse, who's the young woman who was the customer at the garage at the start. And so what we're conveying here is that as we move through the world, we both have, you know, we are entrusting information to others, we have expectations and rights in relation to how our personal information will be treated, but we're also agencies who have responsibilities and obligations under the Privacy Act. So I guess what the creatives have done is think, well, you know, what, what, what's the essence here? And I think it's um, the kind of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done to you. Protect your, you know, other people's personal information as you would expect yours to be protected. Now, like any golden rule, that's never going to be uh, perfect uh, because there are chronic oversharers out there who, um, 
you know, we wouldn't want to be uh, the benchmark, would we? Um, but uh, nonetheless, I think they did a good job, and you know, it cost us 300 of your 300 grand of your money, so we thought we'd better uh, show you it. <laughs> Last year, uh, in January, we sort of huddled around and made a plan. Huh. <laughs> Idiots. Um, it was a busy year. Uh, we knew what was coming. We had started a process um, uh, the year before that we called Privacy 2.0, a reflection on how we take advantage of the relatively modest uh, changes coming to the Privacy Act and rethink the way we position ourselves in the economy uh, and how we get the best value uh, for all New Zealanders uh, with the Privacy Act and privacy regulation. That involved um, thinking about how we do what we do, uh, and it involved um, thinking about unmet needs in the community, what we weren't doing. Uh, so we designed an organisational chart, we had a, a restructure planned. So we, we headed into 2019 knowing that we had a full year of doing what we always do, our business as usual. We then overlaid onto that a restructure and reorganisation and a fundamental rethinking of our role in the economy and our role as regulators. We also knew that there was uh, an act coming into force that we had to implement, so we rolled that over the top. Uh, so we already had you know, three times as many things to do uh, as we uh, would normally have, and then suddenly, like a freight train, COVID hit us, uh, like everybody. Uh, and it sent us home, like everybody, but it also completely upended our work program. Uh, suddenly, um, our policy capacity and our inquiries capacity was completely dominated by COVID. Can an employer demand to know whether an employee has been tested, uh, whether they've tested positive? Should we use cell phone tracking to monitor self-isolation compliance? Uh, what about giving everyone a compulsory... Uh, token device to carry around with them everywhere? Um, what are the alternatives to paper contact tracing registers? You know, does privacy even matter in a high trust pandemic management environment? So we've grappled with these and other topics and I can't recall another year like it where one single issue has dominated our lives to such an extent. And during this year the Privacy Act changed as I mentioned. Uh, my office marked the change with the campaign um, but the Act uh, has meant changes for our office as well. For the last 27 years, we've mostly acted on a point-to-point -point basis. We get one complainant, we get one respondent, we deploy experts in dispute resolution, mostly lawyers, they understand the facts, they try and bring the parties together and try and resolve them. The burning question for us has been how to uh, extract and learn from those uh, interactions and transactions uh, for the benefit of the wider economy, because that's not actually a very efficient way to bring change across a whole system. With a staff of uh, 40, in a typical year we will deal with about 800 complaints, something like 8,000 public inquiries, 300 media inquiries, and over 100 policy proposals and cabinet papers. With more regulatory tools available to us under the Privacy Act 2020, uh, we've got the opportunity to become a more influential and effective regulator. So we've shifted our mindset from focusing on individual complaints to a greater focus on systemic issues. We're looking outward at emerging issues and what we're seeing internationally to deliver the best privacy outcomes for the greatest public benefit. It's my responsibility as Commissioner to ensure that we get the maximum influence from our regulatory powers and that those who are harmed by privacy breaches are properly compensated. Good privacy outcomes are best achieved when everybody understands their rights and responsibilities and is motivated to act on them. Our goal is to achieve high levels of voluntary compliance, and we do this by using uh, industry bodies and other networks to try and achieve a multiplier effect with our regulatory actions. Oops. We've developed this compliance and regulatory action framework to um, uh, direct our resources. The question is for us, how do we decide what to focus on? You know, for 27 years, we've been almost entirely demand-driven. Uh, our limited budget has meant we haven't really been able to set our own agenda. 
we get the complaints come in, we get those policy questions, we get those inquiries, and we're on a hamster wheel. We've got very little capacity to sort of raise up and set our own agenda. But with the uh, introduction of the Privacy Act 2020 and our subsequent budget increase, we've been able to set up, to think about new ways of working and set our own agenda and identify ways to maximise our reach as a regulator. So the new budget allocation has meant we've been able to spend it on new talent without having to take resources away from our existing teams. I mentioned that um, uh, we got two million extra dollars and I said to the investigations and dispute resolution team and the policy team and the inquiries people and uh, all the others, we've got a whole lot of extra money, you're not getting any of it, you're welcome. <laughs> By which we meant, you know, we had to restructure, we've got to make room uh, for extra capacity. But I was really grateful to the government uh, for giving us extra money so that we could stand up a compliance enforcement team so I could employ a, a new assistant commissioner uh, for strategy and insights without having to take away from the other services which we've been providing so efficiently and competently for such a long time. So adapting uh, to our new privacy law framework is a process which uh, I've been calling Privacy 2.0, which is kind of lame, I know. It's sort of retro-futuristic. <laughs> our new law requires new ways of doing things and a re-evaluation of how we allocate our resources. As an office, we've been reflecting on and reviewing on how we work as a regulator. A new legal framework is a challenge as well as a solution. The letter of the law is one thing, but there's discretion and judgment to be applied in the exercise of those functions. How can we make the best use of the enforcement powers? How can we ensure we are achieving the best strategic outcomes? How can we work more effectively? For our New Zealand context, my office has designed a compliance and regulatory framework. It's a strategy document that sets out the principles which will guide how we will apply our new law. And we've um, stolen it, mostly. Uh, we've looked across best practice from our colleague regulators in other jurisdictions and also domestically at um, other regulators in other sectors to have a really um, disciplined approach to how we allocate our resources now that we have some discretionary capacity, now that we have uh, a greater range of regulatory powers. So you'll see here, like a, a traditional uh, regulatory pyramid, we have uh, a considerable emphasis on trying to meet those who are wanting to comply and make it as easy for them as possible. And you will fall into that category. You'll be pleased to know. But you, you've made the effort to come here to inform yourselves. You're down at the thick end of the pyramid there. We're here to help you. We'll walk with you. We'll provide you with resources uh, and we'll help out. As we go up, if we find organisations that are uh, um, recalcitrant or negligent or uh, repetitively um, in breach of their obligations or ignorant of them in ways which could cause significant harm, we are going to deploy those uh, more punitive sanctions that are available to us. At a micro, I mean, at a macro level, this, this uh, compliance and regulatory action framework helps us to decide where we allocate our resources and how we prioritise areas of interest and inquiry, and I'm going to come to some of those today. We're seeing evidence of that, and we're presenting some of the fruits of that today uh, with the panels that we've got. But I've also asked staff to think about these kinds of, uh, these kinds of choices, allocative choices, um, at a micro level. When a complaint comes across their desk, you know, what's the level of harm that is involved in this matter? Has the person had a really significant uh, uh, negative outcome which warrants the um, full application of our um, interventions? Or is it something that's a matter of principle? And if it is, what is that principle? Is there a public benefit? Is it significant across the economy or is it just to this person? So these kinds of, um, this kind of thinking is going to inform how we allocate our resources. It's been quite a journey, and it's, it's not an easy conversation to have with a bunch of really highly principled, value-driven people who know that they hold considerable power over people's ability to access what are statutory rights. But not all complaints are equal. And it is unfair and inequitable, I think, uh, to allocate the same effort and resource 
to a uh, trivial matter as it is to one that has uh, significantly affected an individual or may have a, a, a widespread impact across the economy. So we're being more deliberate about how we allocate all our resources. Uh, so insights and strategy is a new um, division in my organisation and it's helping us to make informed decisions about where we will get the most impact of our interventions using our data, as uh, modest as it is. You know, we, we, we always talk about being in a data-driven economy. Well, we've got to start um, walking that talk. Enforcement and compliance requires agencies to recognise that my office has greater powers that we can use to make them take privacy seriously and a failure to do so may mean consequences. So we've got now a new compliance and enforcement team. You know, for many years, we've only been able to uh, write letters and use moral suasion. And the complaints team, uh, at the end, might write a letter and say, this matter constitutes an interference with privacy. And you know what that threshold is, don't you, right? That somebody who makes a complaint, who seeks our intervention, has to... Uh, present us with a, a fact scenario which constitutes a breach of an information privacy principle combined with some harm or loss or damage or significant injury to feelings or significant loss of dignity. So there's a whole lot of stuff that doesn't get on the radar. Now uh, our enforcement and compliance team can go out looking for stuff and they don't have to worry about that uh, threshold. They can find things which may result in um, a significant inconvenience multiplied many times up and down the economy that would never reach the threshold uh, for an interference and the justification for uh, the awards of damages that's required under the complaints regime, but nonetheless are making an impact on individuals' lives uh, and in aggregate are making a significant impact across the economy. So that is going to be a proactive function uh, of looking at compliance in areas where our intelligence is telling us um, uh, we need to focus some resource. And of course our investigations and dispute resolution team are focused on dealing with the complaints, but they're doing it faster and they're triaging them as they come in much more um, assertively uh, than uh, we have in the past. Sorting them against these matrices of harm and seriousness, the areas of law they fall under and other criteria so that we can ensure we focus our resources on the complaints that will have the biggest impact uh, on individual and collective privacy. What's that got to do with you? Well, we're going to be sending them back to you. We're going to be asking people more and more who come to us and say, this thing happened. Uh, well, OK, have you talked to the privacy officer at that organisation? And if the answer is no, then we'll be directing them to come back to you and giving you the opportunity to resolve the matter at first instance without our intervention. During the first six months uh, of the Privacy Act 2020, our primary focus has been on education and awareness of the new obligations under the Act. But New Zealand businesses and organisations have had 27 years, and in some cases even longer, to get requirements like access, security and disclosure right, so we won't hesitate to use the new powers that Parliament has given us to uphold people's rights. We haven't seen a compliance notice yet, or an access direction but I'm chomping at the bit. <laughs> but don't tell anyone, because regulators aren't supposed to say things like that. <laughs> Giving people access to their own information is not a new thing. This right uh, has existed across the whole economy since 1993, uh, and in the public sector uh, since 1982. But still, many organisations fail to comply with this most basic right. We're now able to direct organisations to uh, bring the change uh, to, to um, release information under a um, principle six request. And we will be doing that. You know, the problem that we found in the, these six months uh, with my enthusiasm for uh, using these new obligations is that uh, the team has got so used to being persuasive, they're really good at it. So um, I keep saying, is this one for an access direction? Can we use a compliance notice here? And they say, okay, well, first of all, we'll just We'll just give them the opportunity to comply. And I'm thinking, please don't, please don't. <laughs> but every single time they do, right? So um, it's a credit to the team. But um, I do think, um, you know, if we, if we don't use the, 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 um, the powers and resources that Parliament has given us, they will wither. Um, 
the future is coming. Uh, in my office, like uh, all other data protection authorities, um, are continuing to face complex privacy issues in associated with increasingly pervasive uh, digital technologies. We live in a precarious new world of algorithms and artificial intelligence making decisions that affect our choices, as well as decisions that are made about us. Everywhere we look, companies, governments and individuals are actively collecting our personal information. Facial recognition software, biometric verification, deep fake technology and drones. I didn't lift this from the minister's speech, by the way. I, we're just thinking along the same lines. They're all becoming commonplace. It's a problem that I call the democratization of digital technologies or the retail availability. You want a facial recognition? Download an app. Uh, so these are commonplace and the ability of people to live a life away from a lens of cameras or from public detection is only becoming more difficult, particularly in this remote working, contact tracing, pandemic management economy. These challenges require us to think in new ways. For example, we used to think in a kind of binary way about being in public spaces and the law drove this. If you're out there in the street, capable of being observed, you don't have an expectation of privacy. But that approach increasingly is too blunt when we think of the potential harms of the ubiquitous CCTV coverage combined with facial recognition technology. Do we have a right, or should we have a right, to go about our business unobserved, without being collected, collated, and curated? Against this backdrop, privacy rights and legal frameworks need to be refreshed regularly to keep pace with developing technology. Our Privacy Act 2020, as you know, stopped somewhat short of the benchmark set by the GDPR. We got a bit out of sync. The Law Commission reported in 2011, the government responded in 2014, and GDPR um, was finally settled uh, in 2016. But the policymakers had already kind of moved on, and there was no space left in their work program to uh, reflect on things, even though uh, we'd... Uh, fallen behind. One thing we did catch up with, though, was uh, breach reporting. And this is the one significant new obligation imposed on you as agencies. We all have rights and obligations under the Privacy Act 2020 to protect personal information that we hold. Where there is a breach of privacy, where you lose control of information in a way that could cause serious harm, there is now a legal obligation to let my office know and to tell the individuals concerned so that they can take steps to protect themselves. Making breach reporting mandatory will reveal to us over time the scale of serious privacy breaches in New Zealand. In the past, we've only been able to assume that, like an iceberg, the fraction beneath the sea level is much larger than the visible fraction. Mandatory reporting will also offer us lessons in how the breaches are happening and where our intervention would, most use, would be most useful in addressing the biggest causes. Somebody um, on the Slido, I noticed, by the way, Slido you can use just from your browser, you don't need to download an app, um, and the first question was lodged 20 hours ago, which makes me a little bit suspicious, comms team. <laughs> but it was probably, they were testing it, I don't know, it said if you have, could have one, one power to be added to the Privacy Act, what would it be? I think it would be the power to go back in time and reinvent email and make it a bit harder to um, stuff things up. Because what we see through uh, our reports is that um, email is a really significant um, source of privacy breaches. I could stand here for the rest of the morning, I better just check the time, uh, and tell horror stories about um, email breaches. And you know the rule of thumb, don't you? that when you send that spreadsheet with a pivot table in it with 5,000 client details in it, it's going to go to the person who has the biggest axe to grind against your organisation. So not only have you uh, imperiled your customers or your patients or your clients or the citizens, um, you've actually bought yourself a, a reputational nightmare. So we need to be um, learning these lessons. Uh, the statistics bear out our suspicion that email is a, is a significant um, risk factor in organisations. 
and it's um, all of our responsibility to try and learn from and improve practice on this. Let me just tell you one horror story. It's probably my favourite. The person who rang the district council and said, I'd like to make a complaint, please. Uh, and the telephonist said, sure. Would you mind doing it on our form, please? And he goes, yeah, could you email it to me? And she says, yes, sure. She drags, she drops, she presses send, she sends the entire complaints database. <laughs> <laughs> With every complainant and every person complained against and all the complaints. So, oops. Learn from these. It could be you I'm making fun of next <laughs> privacy forum. We've had a number of uh, inquiries and at least one complaint concerning contact tracing registers. We've also been notified of cases where there's been a very real potential for serious harm to result. There have been cases where individuals have been contacted inappropriately and harassed because their details were exposed on a paper register. For this reason, contact tracing registers need to be carefully set up and managed in ways that protect a person's details from being accessed and misused by others. I hope we can end the practice of paper registers where people's information is readily, easily able to be viewed by others. While businesses are trying to do the right thing and we're all grappling with new obligations, it's not good practice. We were talking about this uh, in our leadership team meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I said to the team, how is it that, you know, a year later, there's still these forms at every front door that expose every visitor to every other one? And someone said, we've got one at our front door. <laughs> Audience, we do not now. We have a ballot box. So there are simple solutions for some of these things, right? Um, I remember within the first couple of weeks of the pandemic, I wrote a blog post about um, contact tracing registers um, at uh, bars. And a friend who runs a restaurant says, look, what we've done is we just get a burner, a burner phone and we ask people to text their details to it. Simple. It's, uh, you know, you're meeting your obligations. So we need to innovate in the way that we uh, adapt to these uh, new challenges. And we'll be trying to uh, be there and, and help with that. Digital contact tracing. I mean, if, uh, if the paper registers get a brickbat, then the development of privacy-friendly apps like the New Zealand COVID Tracer app and Ripple deserve bouquets for their privacy-by-design approach to creating digital systems of recording movements. These put the user in control of their information. We've been consulted in the development of the COVID Tracer app, and I've been publicly supportive of it because it certainly uh, met the principles of uh, privacy by design. The information collected on a phone stays on the phone and is only released with the person's consent if there's been an exposure notification. To date, over 2.5 million New Zealanders have downloaded the app. A recent call by a New Zealand academic has raised the issue of using legislation to protect contact tracing information from being used for other purposes. Some people have raised concern that police or intelligence services could seek a warrant for a phone and then take the NZ COVID Tracer app data off the phone. In my submission to Parliament, I recommended that there should be a prohibition on the reuse or disclosure of personal information that has been collected for contact tracing purposes. I think it's really um, instructive to compare New Zealand's approach with uh, Singapore. Singapore uh, originally um, was one of the first countries to uh, deploy a contact tracing app uh, and then they issued a token to supplement that and they've got really good uptake of it based on undertakings that that information would be kept only and only used for pandemic management purposes. But in January, um, the uh, privacy statement was uh, amended to make it clear that the contact tracing information maintained in those uh, facilities um, would be available for police purposes. And that's caused something of an uproar. And I think that there's a real risk that that undermines the social contract uh, and, in fact, undermines the pandemic management response. So we'll be looking at um, 
the situation as it develops uh, in Singapore. But I am really confident that we're not going to see that here. I think that we've seen officials, public health officials and politicians recognise the centrality of privacy uh, and respect for personal information uh, to the pandemic management. There's going to be more uh, issues associated with COVID. We've uh, still got to deal with uh, vaccine passports uh, and, and the like. And we've got to deal still with um, the kind of ignorance and fear uh, that drives ostracism and vilification. Uh, and if we see people who uh, decide not, for whatever reason, to get vaccinated, you know, we don't want to see them uh, with social opprobrium heaped upon them and driven uh, to more and more extreme positions. So there are, you know, we're not out of the woods yet with the privacy challenges uh, as well as the other uh, economic and social challenges presented by the pandemic. One of the other areas that we've decided to focus on after applying our uh, compliance and regulatory action framework to our work program is the uh, rental sector. Earlier in the year, I announced our intention to focus on the collection, retention and disclosure of personal information in the rental accommodation sector. A supply shortage in our under-pressure housing sector has created an evident power imbalance which tilts towards landlords and property managers. This is manifested particularly as widespread and intrusive information collection practices when choosing uh, new tenants. We've spent some time in consultation with the sector, landlords, property managers, tenants and intermediary agencies, to ensure we have a good understanding of the practices. And I think we're going to learn a bit about uh, the outcome of that process uh, at a panel uh, coming up soon. But um, it doesn't take long looking around to see some of the um, uh, intrusive practices that uh, we've encountered. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a property manager who appeared in front of a select committee uh, talking about proposed changes to um, residential tenancy laws. And she said, well, you know, some of these people, you look at their bank statements and it says, KFC, KFC, McDonald's, the warehouse, and you just know what kind of person you're getting. Really? Yeah, you're getting someone who likes chicken. <laughs> um, so we are interested in uh, setting some clear uh, parameters and boundaries for landlords. Um, and I don't want to pick on the sector. I know that most landlords are just trying to provide a service, uh, trying to get some return from their asset. Um, but it is a sector that needs some pretty clear boundaries, I think. I was kind of horrified, actually. I don't use that kind of language lightly, uh, but I was horrified to learn that um, after a law reform to prevent, uh, to help uh, resolve the appalling problem of um, domestic violence uh, and remove some of the obstacles for people uh, getting out of dangerous situations for them and their children. Uh, one of the reforms proposed was that the 21-day notice period imposed on tenants could be reduced to two days uh, where the person was experiencing domestic violence. Because, you know, you don't want to say, should I um, pay double rent for three weeks? Or, um, uh, you know, is, is that going to be an obstacle to getting my children to safety. You don't want to have those calculations, right? So the policy is humane and sensible. And it was passed, so that's now law. At a seminar uh, introducing that law to um, property managers, one person stood up and said, OK, so does that mean now we're allowed to ask prospective tenants whether they're likely to be experiencing family violence? Hmm, I think you might be looking at the problem the wrong way. One of the um, reforms in the Act which has um, prompted a fairly deep reflection in our office is, is quite modest. It simply says that in addition to having to take into account uh, the legitimate needs of business and government to go about their business in an efficient way, I also need to take into account different cultural perspectives uh, on privacy. And this has led us to think about uh, the communities that we're serving and whether we are serving all communities um, equally. And I think we've found that the answer is no. Uh, 
and it shouldn't have really taken uh, that law reform to prompt this uh, reflection. Uh, we have long owed a responsibility to tangata whenua uh, to um, engage with te ao Māori uh, and to ensure that we are providing culturally appropriate services and that we are reaching um, a segment of the community that may um, know, you know, may be less aware of privacy rights uh, and of the services our office offers. And in fact, our survey results bear this out. Uh, while we have really good visibility uh, across the population, uh, you know, in the, into the high 80s, um, when we come to Māori and Pacifica communities and Asian communities, um, that visibility drops down into the mid-60s. So we do have some work to do there. Uh, we are early in our engagement, our journey of being more visible and relevant to Māori. Uh, but we... Um, uh, very interested in uh, developing that work and to engage and partner with Māori on the issues that most that matter most to them in ways that are both tika and pono. Uh, and to do that, we are engaging. We are currently recruiting a principal advisor Māori uh, to help us uh, reach those communities and to help us imbue Te Ao Māori into the way we do all of our work. Another area of focus, and I'm just about done, uh, is to uh, aim to get people their personal information in a timely manner. Because complaints make up about 70% of our, I mean, access complaints make up about 70% of our complaint workload. Getting good um, practice out of um, public sector agencies is not straightforward, and we're not confident that we can do it using our internal intelligence services uh, sources alone. For example, it's actually difficult to correlate the number of complaints received against an agency with their performance. Some of the complicating factors are we can't easily tell whether a respondent agency is in breach. For example, an investigation may have been closed because the information in dispute was subsequently provided, so we haven't made a finding. Some agencies might be better at making people aware of their right to complain than, to us than others, resulting in more complaints. So we've got some challenges. Uh, but we're working with Te Kawa Mataho, the Public Service Commission, and GCPO to put in place systems that build a picture of agency-level performance and to provide transparency. And we're looking at uh, raising the game in terms of compliance today, but also trying to look forward and say, well, this is a right that's sat on the statute books that depends on people writing letters to each other uh, and getting um, hard copies of documents. Uh, it's been there for 40 years in the public sector. What should access look like in the future? How are you designing your systems to be uh, customer focused and, and, and having that access right more frictionless? So that's going to be um, an interesting uh, journey for us as well. But we can't do all these things alone. We rely on our colleagues and other agencies to help inform our approach to the emerging privacy issues that we share. And I hope that joining with you and working together and harnessing collective knowledge, each of us can be far more effective at delivering beneficial privacy outcomes for all New Zealanders. That's our mission, and I hope to come back and report to you on how we're doing on that the next time we convene a forum. Thank you. We have a bit of time for... Um, Questions or comments or observations? We do have a few questions. So oh, good. Slido. Thank you. Okay. So thank you all for uh, putting your questions forward. Um, and also, as John had mentioned, if you don't feel comfortable downloading the app, you can just go straight through your browser and participate that way. So thank you for the point. Uh, first up, how does the Privacy Act acknowledge data sovereignty, for example, the collection of genealogy in Belmaldi? Mm, yeah. Um, it's, um, I don't think it does very well. For one thing, uh, probably the most significant impediment, uh, in law anyway, is that the definition of personal information uh, refers only to information about living people. So whakapapa... Uh, beyond the, the, the realm of the living is not actually subject to the Privacy Act. Um, so that's a significant limitation. It doesn't mean to say that the same principles can't be applied by uh, custodians of 
um, of uh, whakapapa information. Uh, and, you know, there are um, specific protections elsewhere on the statute book for that kind of information. For example, the Electoral Act um, has uh, particular protections uh, for people who are um, enrolled on the Māori roll. Thank you. I'm certain that later on this afternoon in our second panel um, with our special guest Tahu Kukutai and others will be able to discuss that a little yes. bit more. Um, and I'm hoping too that there's an opportunity to add more layers to the conversation because there's quite a bit in regards to the uh, difference between individual privacy rights and also collective privacy rights, which I'm certain we'll discuss. There is, and, and I sort of skipped over the first part of the question, which was about um, data sovereignty, and that's a, a, an emerging topic which... Um, I'm really interested in hearing what Tahu has to say about it. There is a, an increasing call, I think, to um, see um, Māori data maintained in the whenua and not exported. Um, and I guess um, principle, the new Principle 12 uh, is supportive of that. How do employers approach vaccination status of their staff with respect to the health and safety obligations to the team to get vaccinated? Um, well, I think, uh, you know, this is probably more of an employment law question, but um, employees uh, have an obligation to follow a reasonable instruction. Uh, employers under the Health and Safety Act uh, have obligations to keep people safe. And I think when you put those obligations together, you find that it is legitimate for an employer to um, have a requirement, or it may be legitimate for an employer to have a requirement that certain roles uh, require someone to be vaccinated. Uh, and if that's a requirement of a, of a role, then um, it's reasonable to ask for evidence uh, of um, vaccination. Chris says, with a large amount of information being stored in the cloud and hosted overseas now, do you think that we are sufficiently protected by the new Principle 12? Um, well, now, Principle 12... There's, I think the question represents a, a common misunderstanding or misconception. Um, principle 12 is the new one which says if you are going to send personal information to an agency that is not within New Zealand, there are certain steps that need to be taken. For example, either you undertake due diligence to ensure that the destination jurisdiction has a comparable level of privacy protection, or you send the information with contractual clauses attached to it that send a bit of the New Zealand Privacy Act with it and ensure that it continues to retain that comparable privacy protection. But Principle 12 does not in fact apply, uh, in our view, to uh, transactions which simply involve um, storage or the provision of cloud services. So where you are using uh, Amazon AWS or Microsoft Azure in Sydney or in the US, that information is traveling and sitting on those racks and Microsoft and Amazon are doing nothing to it. They're simply providing that rack space and, and, and an ability for you to send it back and forth. In law, that is deemed not to be a disclosure. So where the uh, destination agency makes no independent use of the information, uh, Principle 12 is not, in fact, engaged. I'm not sure um, that Principle 12... Um, well, no, I won't go there. We'll see how it works. <laughs> I think it's a bit complicated. Um, let me say um, I've, I've kind of climbed off the fence a little bit um, in recent uh, talks, and I've started to come to the view that the international data transfer system uh, is broken. It's not just our Principle 12, but internationally... It's, it's a real problem. You know, we saw a decision recently from a data protection authority in Bavaria, and uh, the Bavarian DPA said that a company using MailChimp, a US-based newsletter emailing company, uh, was in breach of the GDPR, even though it used EU-approved standard contractual clauses, and they somehow got uh, male chimp to agree to them. Now the reasoning was that uh, the, the 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 entity using the um, using male chimp the service could not be satisfied through the use of the standard contractual clauses 
that US intelligence or law enforcement agencies might not access that information. Now, why the hell would the NSA care about a carpet manufacturer's weekly newsletter about their specials? Uh, you know, I think it's, it's crazy. And we've got Shrems and Shrems too, uh, co costing billions of dollars in transatlantic trade uh, for in what I consider to be very limited um, added privacy value. But anyway, that's my own personal um, hobby horse and I've departed from the question a little. Uh, we've got a couple of questions left. When you look at those levels of harm on a person, for example, in a complaint, what lens are you taking? Some people care a lot, some not so much. Yeah, and um, you know, it's, it's those emotional harms um, are very subjective in nature. Uh, and some people will be um, very distressed. So we, uh, we, we take people as we find them. I mean, we had a case where there was a breach involving a, um, a spreadsheet emailed from a DHB to an unknown address, uh, and the spreadsheet contained uh, the details of 60 uh, people who had received bariatric surgery. Now, I'm not sure... The, whether the agency dealt with it right or wrong, but they, they thought they'd better notify people. So they sent a letter. It was a bit ham-fisted. It wasn't very sensitively done. And they wrote to 60 people saying, hey, we told someone, we don't know who they are, that you had bariatric surgery. Sorry about that. Now, I don't know, 40, 45 people went, I don't care. I look great. <laughs> and I walk down the street and people know that, you know, I'm powerful and healthy. And maybe 10 people said, well, you know, that doesn't fill me with confidence. That's, you know, what, what are you going to do with other, you know, sensitive information? And about four people were really devastated. You know, this was a betrayal for them. Uh, and they were able to give us... Um, uh, evidence from counsellors and doctors which showed just how profoundly upset they'd been, how, how distressing this had been for them to know that their health information had been um, lost and, and lost control. So it is a subjective uh, thing and, and we're, not, we're not applying our own um, harden up kind of filter to um, our complainant's experience. But we are going to say, yes, we understand that um, you're annoyed that you keep getting an email offering you specials at farmers. But that's not significant humiliation or significant injury to feelings or significant distress. That's annoyed. Are you proposing to issue advice for employers about the COVID-19 vaccinations like the Australian Privacy Commissioner? Um, well, you've caught me out. I don't know what the Australian Commissioner has done, but she's a very competent person, so I'm sure that we'd uh, like to um, ride on her coattails and borrow from that. So, yeah, but until we do, um, I'm pretty confident you could probably rely on hers. So a long time ago, there was a French guy called Montesquieu. <laughs> and he went to England, and he looked at their system of government, and he wrote a, a, a treatise called The Separation of Powers. So we have the parliament, we have the judiciary, and we have the, um, what's the other one? The executive. So the Privacy Act um, mostly applies to the executive, doesn't it, as well as the private sector. The parliament manage, is, manages its own... Uh, conduct and affairs, and there are standing orders, there is a parliamentary privileges committee, uh, there is um, the speaker, and there's also um, internal uh, political uh, disciplinary processes. Um, so, you know, I, th I think I'm, I'm venturing into policy. I, you know, why does the Privacy Act not apply? I, I, it's, it's really that constitutional separation that um, uh, is carried over in a number of bits of legislation. It's the same reason, I guess, that um, courts in relation to their judicial functions uh, are not subject to the Privacy Act. Awesome. Final question. Is it privacy 
Privacy. <laughs> it's a tomato or tomato? Yeah. Should we just check, um, okay, Marie, see if there's any, anyone from the floor who may not have a, um, a slider or have been reluctant to use it for privacy reasons. Would anybody like to ask something from the floor? Yes. You mentioned you're keen to enforce your power. Um, do you have a time model? When can we expect to see this happening? Because most of our clients, our direct feedback is that great people will call us, we're going to wait two or three years to see some other people get through, and then we'll take it seriously. Okay, could you give me a list of their names? <laughs> Um, you know, when I see it, uh, I'll do it. Um, if, if, it's, if it's a failure to notify us of, uh, of a breach, we're probably still at the um, uh, education uh, end of the compliance framework. Uh, if I see um, egregious breaches of um, security, uh, we might start issuing compliance notices saying, you know, patch that server or... Um, you know, update your privacy uh, policy. We have to actually, I, I mean, I mentioned the point earlier, we, we've got an obligation to give people some warning to, you know, we've got a process that we have to follow in the legislation. Uh, and we are finding a pretty high level of compliance with that. But as we get more active and go out looking for stuff, I think that we will um, uh, find opportunities uh, to start deploying uh, those tools. Back right. John, what's the current Yeah, um, it's, it, it, there's an interesting barrier point um, where we cross into metaphysics, I think. Uh, if we talk about a right of access to thought processes uh, and ideas, um, the Act allows people a right of access to information held. So it doesn't have to be physically held, but it does have to exist. And if I say, what do you think about something, I'm asking you to create something. That's probably taking a step too far. I mean, we've always followed the same approach as the Ombudsman do to the Official Information Act, which is that if you hold the information in your head uh, and can record it, um, then that is uh, uh, amenable to request. But I think we're starting to intrude on our next panel's time. So thank you so much, uh, Kay Marie, and thank you all. Um, enjoy the day. Awesome, John. Thank you so much. And it gives us a really great insight across so many different levels. And aren't we lucky to have a commissioner that keeps his finger on the pulse uh, for all New Zealanders um, in this particular time?